musicians are often a creative response to the art he's talking about. Vasari ends part two of his lives, The Silver Age, with Luca Signorelli, who, he argues, clears the way for the giants who will bring his story to its climax. The hilltop town of Orvieto contains Signorelli's greatest works. For me, his frescoes in the cathedral, begun in 1499, are an achievement worthy of comparison with Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, which was indeed partly inspired by these extraordinary works. This really is one of the most jaw-dropping fresco cycles ever painted. And even though Vasari praised them to the skies, they're still a surprisingly little-known treasure. What they depict, with startling vividness and an almost comic strip vigor, is the end of the world. Showers of blood rain down on panicking crowds of humanity. The Antichrist delivers his evil sermon, the devil whispering in his ear. Strange beasts fly through the air as the damned are hurried off to hell by demons with alarmingly green bottoms. The dead heave themselves out of the ground as the last trumpet is blown. Signorelli's even added a painted audience of the great Italian poets, including Dante, with his own visions of heaven and hell. For Vasari, Signorelli was one of those artists who weaves together all the different strands of what has come before and creates them into the fabric of a vision that seems to predict the future. For Vasari, Signorelli combined Giotto's genius with Masaccio's sense of sacred drama, all expressed in a language that looks directly back to the classical past. But for Vasari, Signorelli pulls all of these things together, but pushes them into the future by setting everything on a, on a vastly enlarged, monumental scale. This is the scale of Raphael and Michelangelo. This is the scale of the High Renaissance, and Vasari says so. He says, Michelangelo's art would not have been possible without that of Signorelli. One generation climbs on the shoulders of the next. But it doesn't quite end there because for Vasari himself, Signorelli was a crucial figure in his own life. When he looked up at that self-portrait, he looked with gratitude because when he was a boy, Signorelli had come to Arezzo and had said to Vasari's father, that boy has talent. Encourage him in the career of artist and he will go far. So Vasari's conception of art history as a kind of collaboration, as one person helping another, is epitomized by Signorelli not only on, if you like, the cosmic level, but at the personal level. He was the artist who Vasari felt he'd, if you like, held his own hand and encouraged him and said, yeah, come and be an artist. Come and join us. Vasari is so well known as the author of the lives of the artists and so forgotten as a painter and architect in his own right that most of the millions of people who flock every year to Florence's famous Uffizi don't even know that he designed it. I'm not here to visit the main museum, but a secret rooftop passage that Vasari also designed. The Vasari corridor is notoriously difficult to gain access to but it contains one of the world's great secret art collections. And for me, it is Vasari's Lives of the Artists in bricks and mortar. Leading me into this last labyrinth is a less than talkative lady called Rita. The oldest problem in the, in the world is trying to... <laughs> you, you get access, but whether you can actually get in or not. See? Bye. Si, si, if you can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Wow. Welcome to the Vasari Corridor. Here we are. There's Giorgio, man himself. One of the things I love about the Vasari Corridor is the fact, just the fact of its name, partly, because Giorgio Vasari was a man who desperately wanted to get into the corridors of power. And here he is, actually building the Medici's principal corridor of power, a literal corridor that expresses